good morning, good afternoon, or good evening. On behalf of the Department of Law of South University, it is my utmost pleasure to invite you to do this webinar. Before I in formally invite our guest speaker, Professor Mariam Jamshidi, let me invite my esteemed colleague, Department Chair, Mr. Arafat Hussain Khan, for his introductory remarks. Arafat, over to you. Thank you. Um, thank you, sir. Um, uh, am I audible? Thank yes, you. Sir. Uh, very good evening to you all. And uh, I think it's good morning for Ms. Mariam Jamshidi. Um, it, it is my great honor and privilege to welcome you to the uh, talk uh, tonight, um, uh, lecture on the political economy of foreign uh, sover sovereign immunity. Uh, as the chairman of the Department of Law at North South University, I'm delighted to have Ms. Uh, Mariam Jamshedi, um, an esteemed associate professor from the University of Colorado um, Law School as our guest speaker. Foreign sovereign immunity is a very complex and interesting topic that holds uh, significant, significant uh, implication for international law, politics, and global economy. The concept of sovereign immunity seeks to protect sovereign nation from being subjected to the jurisdiction of other states' court, thereby safeguarding their independence and sovereignty. However, uh, this immunity can also raise uh, crucial questions regarding accountability, justice, and uh, rights of individual seeking remedies for um, grievance against foreign governments. Uh, Ms. Mariam Jamshedi, um, uh, an expert in international law uh, and a respected scholar, um, uh, and she has made remarkable contribution uh, to the field, uh, uh, focusing particularly on the political and eco economic uh, dimension of foreign sovereign immunity. Uh, her research and insights have shed light uh, on the complex interplay between the law, politics, and economics in the context of sovereign immunity, providing a valuable perspective uh, for lawmakers, policymakers, legal practitioners, and uh, scholar alike. Tonight, uh, uh, we, we have the privilege uh, of hearing Professor Jamshidi uh, share her expertise and discuss uh, the multi multifactored aspect of the political economy of foreign sovereign immunity. Her talk will uh, un undoubtedly provide us with a deeper understanding uh, of the challenge and opportun uh, opportunities presented by the complex legal doctrine. Um, I'm sure uh, we are going to gain insight uh, uh, into the ways in which sovereign immunity impacts international relations, trade, trade investment, and uh, functioning the global institution. I encourage all of our participants to uh, actively engage uh, in the in, in the dis in, in the discussion um, as as our collective understanding of this political economy of foreign sovereign immunity will uh, shape uh, uh, the future future um, uh, uh, trajectory of international law and have far-reaching uh, implication uh, for states, individual, and the business um, worldwide. Without further ado, uh, I would like to end now. And before I hand things off to um, uh, Rezwan sir, I would like to express my heartfelt uh, gratitude to Professor uh, Mariam Jamshidi for accepting our invitation and sharing our expertise uh, with us tonight. I would also like to thank uh, my fellow colleague, uh, uh, Professor Rizwan islam for arranging um, such, such a like, you know, uh, wonderful webinar and our students and other participants uh, who are here tonight and also all the teaching assistants and member of uh, NSU Law and Mooting Society uh, who basically work uh, uh, to make this uh, uh, event a success. Um, thank you all and uh, Allah peace. Thank you, Arafat, for your introductory remarks. Uh, of course, it is now my pleasure to formally invite Professor Jamshidi to deliver her talk. But uh, dear audience, please don't forget that you can type in your questions by the chat box. Uh, we'll put your questions to Professor Jamshidi once her talk is over. 
Professor Jamshidi, the floor is yours. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you so much, Professor Islam, for inviting me to give this talk. Thank you, Professor Khan, for an incredible introduction and outline of foreign sovereign immunity um, and its role in international law. So, um, so my discussion, um, today's discussion is going to primarily focus on U.S. law on foreign sovereign immunity. As we all know, foreign sovereign immunity is primarily actually a creature of domestic law, even though it also, it obviously has incredibly important international law implications, and there are draft conventions. Um, there's a draft convention on foreign sovereign immunity, but it is largely an area of international law that is very much informed by domestic law. And the U.S. law on foreign sovereign immunity is particularly influential. So I'd like to start uh, with a story that I think highlights the main themes of the paper that I was invited to talk about today. So I'm going to take you back to the 1980s. So during the 1980s, in the early part of the 1980s, Argentina, along with several other Latin American countries, experienced a very serious fiscal crisis. This regional crisis was connected to low interest loans that these Latin American countries had received to support their development in the 1960s and the 1970s, including from private foreign investors. So among the various factors that uh, triggered the fiscal crisis, um, was a decision by the U.S. Federal Reserve, which is basically the U.S. Central Bank, um, to increase interest rates in 1979. And this was a move that other creditor countries followed. This hike in interest rates made it harder for many Latin American countries to repay their debts. So as a result of the interest hike in Argentina, the, de the debt ballooned so high that it would come to equal 50% of revenue from the export of the country's goods and services. That's an enormous amount. So Argentina took various steps to try and deal with the crisis. And that included unilaterally rescheduling the debt that it owed. And in fact, as a sort of side note, the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, had actually required Argentina to do just this in order to receive loans from the organization to help with its economic problems. In walk in some plaintiffs. So plaintiffs in the U.S. Supreme Court case of Republic of Argentina versus Weltover, which I discuss in the paper, were investors who rejected Argentina's unilateral rescheduling of its debts. Now, these plaintiffs um, were two Panamanian corporations and a Swiss bank, and they held $1.3 million in Argentine government bonds and demanded payment in New York, um, as they were, in fact, permitted to do. Plaintiffs brought their suit in U.S. court under the commercial activity exception to the Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act. This, this piece of legislation, which is known as the FSIA, was passed in 1976 and is the sole and exclusive basis for civil litigation against foreign governments, their agencies and instrumentalities in U.S. courts. So the FSIA creates a presumption of immunity unless plaintiffs can show that their case fits under one of the statute's enumerated exceptions to sovereign immunity. So in other words, the FSIA says foreign sovereigns are going to be presumptively immune unless plaintiffs can show that they shouldn't be because an exception to immunity applies. Now, those exceptions include one for commercial activity. So let me now screen share for a second so you can see the text of that provision. So, okay, oops. Sorry, just give me a second and there we go. Okay, 
So under the commercial activity exception to the FSIA, there are three ways that a state can lose its immunity in a suit that's based upon its commercial acts. And all of these different bases require some sort of territorial connection to the United States. So the first potential basis is where the suit is based upon commercial activity carried on in the United States by the foreign sovereign. The second potential basis is where the suit is based upon uh, an act performed in the United States in connection with the commercial activity of the foreign sovereign that happens elsewhere. The third and final potential basis for suit is where the suit is based upon an act outside the territory of the United States in connection with the commercial activity of the foreign sovereign elsewhere. And that act causes what we call a direct effect in the US. So ultimately, the Supreme Court in Weltover found that that third clause of the commercial activity exception, the one on direct effect, applied to plaintiff's claim and allowed it to move forward. Now, in rendering this decision, the, the Supreme Court focused on two key elements of the commercial activity exception, which we'll return to later as well. So the first was the definition of commercial activity, and the second was the requirement that the commercial activity have a territorial connection to the United States, specifically in this case, that it have a direct effect in the U.S. So let's start with the court's approach to the definition of commercial activity, and then we can talk about direct effect. And I hope that this discussion will give you a sort of nice, neat example of the relationship between foreign sovereign immunity doctrine and capitalist principles. So in Weltover, the court defined commercial activity as the type of activity in which a private person typically engages in the marketplace. The court rejected previous efforts by some lower courts to also consider the purpose of the act. So for example, in this case, that Argentina had rescheduled its debt in order to stave off a domestic fiscal crisis. The court's decision on the definition of commercial activity also made clear that a profit motive wasn't necessary to defining an activity as commercial. Now, this definition that the Supreme Court laid out swept incredibly broadly, so broadly that as many noted immediately after the decision and since, there seemed to be very little activity, at least as a theoretical matter, that wouldn't qualify as commercial under this definition. So that's the definition of commercial activity that the court reached in Weltover. As for its decision on the direct effect clause, so the court adopted, again, an approach to that term that was quite broad, and in fact, broader than what many courts had required until that point. And again, many American courts. So according to the Supreme Court, a direct effect follows, and I'm quoting here, follows as an immediate consequence of the defendant's activity and must not be too remote or attenuated. The Supreme Court did not require that the effect be either substantial or foreseeable, which, was, which, which is what many other lower courts in the United States had required until that point. Applying this rule on direct effect, the Supreme Court held that the direct effect clause was satisfied in Weltover simply because plaintiffs had demanded payment in New York in US dollars. That was it. There was no other connection between the suit and the United States other than that. So what's the takeaway from all of this? Well, Weltover's def definition of commercial activity and its approach to direct effect can be understood in various ways, including as an effort to balance the U.S.'s interest in protecting those who have been injured by foreign sovereigns against its interest in having good relationships with those countries. But these approaches can also be understood in terms of their benefit 
to the global financial industry, whose protection and promotion has been central to neoliberal economics, which has been the dominant form of capitalism since the end of the Cold War. How does Weltover support the global financial industry? Well, Weltover does this, um, supports this industry, including America's preeminent place within this industry, by ensuring that transactions with foreign sovereigns involving debts, bonds, and other financial instruments that run through the United States will be amenable to suit under the commercial activity exception to the FSIA. This both protects those kinds of transactions from countries that want to default or have defaulted and encourages financial investors to choose the United States as their pace, place of payment, pace, blah, place of payment in their transactions with foreign governments. Now, the Second Circuit Court of Appeals, which had issued the earlier decision in Weltover that was upheld by the Supreme Court, was actually even more explicit about the benefits to the global financial industry and New York's status within that industry that would flow from recognizing an exception to immunity in this case. And I'd note here that the Second Circuit Court of Appeals, which is an appellate court, its jurisdiction extends to New York City. So the appellate court observed, and again, I quote here, that public policy should make American courts available to foreign plaintiffs as long as this will preserve New York's status as a world financial leader. This is actually in the appellate court's decision. So what does that mean? Well, according to the Second Circuit, to protect New York's status as a global financial hub, debtors to pay their debts that are due in New York, even though plaintiffs are not domiciled in New York, they're not based in New York. So Weltover's alignment with capitalist economic interests isn't unusual or unique. As I try and demonstrate in the article, capitalist interests have aligned in one way or another with the evolution of foreign sovereign immunity doctrine even before the FSIA, the Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act, was passed. This alignment can also be seen in the actual legislative history of the FSIA, as well as in judicial interpretations of the statute's commercial activity exception that you know, include Weltover, but are in no way limited to the decision in Weltover. So in my article, I use a relatively broad definition of capitalism um, and one that I think captures the basic essence of the concept. So as a socioeconomic system in which the means of production are primarily privately owned and operated for profit, a system that is also characterized by competitive markets and wage labor. But of course, there is a lot more to capitalism than just this. It's a system that's gone through various phases and evolved quite dramatically since it first emerged several centuries ago in Britain. So uh, in the interest of making things less abstract and showing how specific aspects of capitalism have influenced the law of foreign sovereign immunity, my article connects the various developments in the doctrine to specific foreign sovereign immunity most clearly started to emerge in judicial decisions, and it continues to the contemporary period. My argument isn't that capitalism necessarily caused particular developments in foreign sovereign immunity doctrine. I'm not trying to make a direct causal argument here. Instead, what I'm urging is that thinking about the doctrine alongside developments in capitalism can provide new insights that help us under understand how the doctrine has operated historically 
um, both in the past and in the present, the present moment. These insights can also help us identify and address some of the inequalities currently perpetuated by the FSIA's commercial activity exception. So the article breaks down the story of capitalism's relationship to foreign sovereign immunity into four chapters, which you can see here. So chapter one is about the Sorry, I think uh, some internet disruption, right? You can't really it's hear. Um, is she going to rejoin? Sorry, sir, you are unmute. We can't really hear you. Okay. Uh, yes, you you are now uh, co-host. Yeah. I'm sorry. I don't know what happened. Uh, no, I think, I think uh, internet. Yeah. Um, I think yeah, it was so, my internet. Um, unfortunately. Okay. But, but anyway, so it's all good now. It's fine. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so I'll I'll pick up where I, where I left off, which was explaining what this sort of chapter one of the story is all about. So again, as I mentioned, this chapter focuses on the U.S. Supreme Court's decision in uh, Schooner Exchange versus McFadden, um, a decision that is widely understood as embracing the absolute theory of immunity, which is this notion that foreign sovereigns are always immune from suit in the courts of other countries, from civil suit. So um, this part of the story highlights the relationship between uh, the rise of a particular brand of capitalism around this period known as laissez-faire capitalism and dicta in the Schooner Exchange case um, that suggested that foreign sovereigns may not, in fact, be immune for their commercial acts. Chapter two is about the relationship between, on the one hand, the reemergence of the state as a commercial actor in the late 19th century, as well as the first real uh, modern spike in globalization. And on the other hand, increasing, albeit tentative, interest in a commercial activity exception to foreign sovereign immunity amongst US courts and the US executive branch, as well as scholars between World Wars I and II. Chapter three examines uh, the period after World War II, when globalization spikes again and communism is now spe spreading relatively rapidly around the globe. This, brand, uh, this chapter of the story shows how these considerations aligned both with the State Department's issuance of what is known as the Tate Letter in 1952. And this, this letter represents the US government's official commitment to restricting the immunity of foreign sovereigns. So both how it relates to the Tate letters issuance and the eventual passage of the FSIA in 1976. The final chapter, chapter four, turns to neoliberalism, which emerged in the late 1970s and early 1980s, but became dominant after the end of the Cold War. This chapter shows how uh, neoliberalism's various trends from the preeminent importance of financial markets to deregulation and economic inequality 
have aligned with judicial interpretations of the commercial activity exception to the FSIA. So I'm going to provide a bit more detail um, on each of these chapters in the story of foreign sovereign immunities, political economy um, during the remainder of this talk, but I'm going to um, hold off on doing too deep of a dive in the interest of time. Of course, if anybody has any questions about some of the specifics of these different portions of the story, please feel free to, to ask during the Q&A. So let's start with chapter one. So Schooner Exchange, again, is generally understood to be um, one of the most famous early judicial decisions on foreign sovereign immunity, particularly for its embrace of the absolute theory of immunity. But at the same time, it contains dicta suggesting that the private activity of states may not necessarily be entitled to immunity and defines that private activity specifically as commercial activity. This equation of commerce with private activity wasn't necessarily an obvious or inevitable one. So while capitalism has always viewed commerce as an exclusively private rather than governmental affair, this wasn't reflected in economic practice for a very long time. Instead, commerce remained an important part of the public activities of states for several centuries after capitalism first emerged in the 1600s. Private corporations also often worked on behalf of and were closely connected with governments during this time. And this was particularly true for the European, the European colonialist project. It wasn't until the rise of laissez-faire policies in the 19th century, and these were policies that depicted the state as an interloper in the private sphere of commerce, that governments, at least in the West, began to exit the commercial sphere, however fitfully and inconsistently, and commercial activity became a private affair and practice. And when I say the West, I mean mostly the Anglo West. It was again, while upholding immunity in that case, the court implicitly drew a line in the sand where commercial activities were concerned, a line that, that comported with the prevailing laissez-faire beliefs of the time. So on most, though not all accounts, the U.S. view on foreign sovereign immunity remained committed to absolute immunity until that Tate letter was issued in 1952 by the State Department. And um, the State Department is basically the U.S. version of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs that we have in most other countries. But as chapter two of the story on the political economy of foreign sovereign immunity shows, this assumption, the United States were just committed to the absolute view of immunity um, until 1952 is not in fact wholly accurate. There was in fact a lot happening in the courts, the executive branch and the scholarly community in favor of adopting a more restrictive approach to sovereign immunity between World Wars I and II although these trends were also admittedly um, a bit inconsistent and, in, and disjointed. So, for example, after World War I, courts were somewhat hesitant to withhold immunity from foreign state-owned merchant ships, but were actually quite willing to do so where state-owned corporations were being sued. For its part, the State Department, which was arguably the most important important and influential executive branch department when it came to crafting the government's position on foreign sovereign immunity, also increasingly adopted the restrictive view uh, on foreign sovereign immunity after World War I. In a number of cases, the State Department suggested to the courts that immunity be withheld from both foreign-owned merchant ships and corporations though the department became a bit more committed to the absolute view of immunity shortly before and during World War II for obvious reasons. So while the executive and judicial branch approaches to restrictive immunity remained tentative during this period, 
the scholarly approach during the early 20th century was solidly in favor of adopting a restrictive view on the immunity of foreign sovereigns. There could have been other motivations for limiting the sovereign immunity of foreign states. So for example, ships owned by foreign sovereigns were regularly getting into accidents on the high seas and those claims were being litigated in US courts. But the push to restrict foreign sovereign immunity was not driven by those kinds of cases. Instead, it was primarily driven by the commercial activity of foreign states. In fact, most of those who promoted restrictions on foreign sovereign immunity, whether they were judges or government officials or scholars, framed this shift as one that would facilitate and encourage cross-border trade between private U.S. businesses and state trading companies. They also framed restrictive immunity as helping to ensure that the reemergence of the state um, as a commercial actor would not distort the rules of the capitalist market system. This push to restrict foreign sovereign immunity coincided with a time when laissez-faire policies were losing some of their attractiveness and states were re-engaging with the commercial sphere as commercial actors. This was also a time when the first significant spike in modern globalization took off, as I mentioned earlier. Like judicial and executive branch approaches to foreign sovereign immunity, this period of capitalism was disjointed. So while free trade did spike, it was characterized by highs and lows, ebbs and flows, as a result of two world wars, the Great Depression, and protectionist trade practices across various countries, including the United States. The push in favor of restrictive immunity during this period also reflected a deeper disconnect between the principle of absolute foreign sovereign immunity and the capitalist commitments of the US legal system. In fact, as efforts to restrict immunity for the commercial activities of foreign states emerged, they were bolstered, they were strengthened by similar restrictions that already existed on the commercial activity of state and federal governments in the United States. So concerns about the commercial activity of foreign sovereigns were also central to the US government's official shift in favor of restrictive immunity via the Tate letter, as well as the eventual passage of the FSIA, which is chapter three in the political economy of foreign sovereign immunity. This desire to restrict the immunity of states for their commercial activities coincided with the second big spike in global trade that happened after World War II, as well as the spread of communism at, uh, after, after that war. So in particular, formally adopting restrictive immunity comported with the United States' interest in undermining the communist economic system and liberalizing and expanding trade across borders by encouraging commerce between American companies and state-owned enterprises, which were becoming more and more common. The commercially focused nature of US concerns with limiting foreign sovereign immunity continued with the passage of the FSIA in 1976. The legislative history of the statute is absolutely riddled with numerous statements from business leaders and private attorneys, as well as executive branch lawyers, describing the FSIA as primarily necessary to protect the commercial interests of American businesses. The final chapter in the political economy of foreign sovereign immunity focuses on judicial interpretations of the FSIA's commercial activity exception itself. So this part of the story shows how neoliberalism, which is marked by the increasing commodification of goods and services, the predominance of financial markets and deregulation, and increasing economic equality has manifested in judicial approaches to two of the most important issues in interpreting the commercial activity exception. 
these are the two issues I flagged a few minutes ago when uh, we were discussing the Weltover case. The first is the definition of commercial activity. And the second is, again, the requirement that the commercial activity have a territorial connection to the United States. So overall, judicial approaches to the commercial activity exception have shown a tendency to protect commercial, private commercial interests that align with the global financial industry. They have privileged continued trade and commerce between US business and foreign sovereigns over certain regulatory interests that tend to favor individuals and relate to human rights, worker and consumer rights, and personal injury. Judicial approaches to the exception have also aligned with neoliberalism's wealth gap by providing greater opportunities for corporate rather than individual plaintiffs to recoup on their financial losses. So as a political economy lens demonstrates, sometimes the interests of neoliberalism have aligned with a broader interpretations of the commercial activity exception that make states more accountable for their commercial activities, while at other times, those interests have been served by narrowing the exception and protecting foreign sovereigns from litigation. On the definition of commercial activity, for example, the Supreme Court's opinions in Weltover, as well as another case called Saudi Arabia versus Nelson, um, which was issued a year after Weltover, have alternatively expanded and limited the definition of, of commercial activity under the statute. These approaches have promoted commodification and benefited interests typically associated with corporations while also undermining interests typically associated with individuals like human rights. On the territorial nexus requirement, some narrow defendant-friendly interpretations of this element have been developed in the context of commercial activity cases raising personal injury, human rights, or employment claims, while broader, more plaintiff-friendly approaches have often emerged in cases that further corporate or financial interests. Similarly, in certain jurisdictions, the territorial nexus requirement has been interpreted more flexibly to protect corporations that have suffered pure financial losses in the United States, but more rigidly applied to individual plaintiffs in the United States suffering the exact same kind of loss. So as the article's conclusion briefly addresses, these insights can and should be the basis for advocating for more egalitarian approaches to the FSIA's commercial activity exception that protect individual interests to the same extent as corporate interests. For example, uh, courts should be more consistent in their application of the definition of commercial activity, regardless of the kind of interest being protected, and ought to treat pure financial losses suffered in the, suffered in the United States the same regardless as the identity uh, regardless of the identity of the litigants so um that's the presentation um i hope that it was um clear and you were able to follow it of course if you have any questions um i welcome them enthusiastically um and thank you again so much for your time and and attention thank you mariam for your excellent lecture we have several questions the first question that I would like to put to you is from one of our teaching assistants, Ms. Saya mm -hmm. Nazabi Saim. Saya asks, is section 1605, sub section eight, subsection two, not an unfair advantage of the United States for intervening in the affairs of other states, particularly commercial activities? Well, the direct effect clause, thank you for the question. Um, you know, the direct effect clause, the territorial nexus requirement is supposed to give the United States a legitimate interest under international law to adjudicate these claims. But the direct effect clause in particular allows for a lot of wiggle room for the courts to interpret, you know, what that requirement actually requires and looks like. 
So, you know, it can be interpreted in such a way as as in the case of uh, Republic of Argentina versus Weltover, um, where the, the, the government of Argentina is effectively uh, hauled into U.S. courts and U.S. courts decide to exercise jurisdiction on what is arguably, and I think it's not even arguable, I think objectively, is a very thin basis for, for a territorial connection to the United States. Simply the fact that these parties could have chosen New York amongst a host of other places for payment on their bonds, right? You know, it is for sure a potential avenue for U.S. courts to interfere in the business, the running of other countries. But again, they exercise that potential power um, in ways that I think can be somewhat explained at least by thinking about what kinds of cases benefit U.S. corporate corporate interests and what cases don't. So Saudi Arabia versus Nelson was also a case, obviously, involving a foreign government where the court held that there wasn't any jurisdiction um, based on plaintiff's claim that he had been tortured and arrested for disclosing certain improprieties that were happening at a Saudi hospital where he worked. He was a U.S. citizen. He had entered into his employment contract in the United States, and then, but then moved to Saudi Arabia and was employed by this hospital. And in that case, the Supreme Court held, no, there is no jurisdiction in that case. So again, I'm not trying to present a theory that explains all cases um, adjudicated under the commercial activity exception, but I do think that if we're thinking about interference by U.S. courts, you know, in the work of other countries, or in the in the sort of sovereign over the sovereignty of other countries, um, thinking about when those those interventions actually happen from a political economy lens is helpful. Um, that being said, there's another doctrine called the Act of State doctrine, which um, can also be invoked in these in these sorts of cases, um, even in cases where the commercial activity may otherwise apply, and the courts have another opportunity to say we ought not to exercise our jurisdiction even though we can, because this involves an act of state. But that gets, I don't want to get too much into the weeds there. Thank you for that answer. The next question that I would like to put to you is on the role of the U.S. State Department. Do you see that historically its role has changed depending on, I think you rightly have pointed out that initially part of the response was based on China and other communist uh, countries, Russia, their state-owned companies. So. Do you have any views on how their position has influenced the U.S. judicial interpretation? Thank you. Certainly, they had enormous influence before the FSIA. Part of, so before that statute was passed in 1976, and part of the impetus, the motivation for passing the statute was to take the State Department out of determinations as to whether or not states should be entitled to sovereign immunity. That being said, so, so now it's it's up to the courts and the courts need to make the decision themselves and not defer to the State Department. That being said, the State Department can and still does weigh in on these cases. It, it, it will submit a, something called a statement of interest where it will take a position. Um, it doesn't always do this. It doesn't have to do this, but it can do this on whether or not um, the FSIA ought to apply or not um, to a particular kind of state. I haven't tracked the extent to which um, U.S. judicial determination, the, those outcomes have aligned with the State Department's own view on whether or not uh, a state ought to be entitled to immunity or not. So I can't say for certain um, what's been happening post-1976, but certainly before 1976, the State Department was um, quite influential. And we might say, Maybe that's not such a bad thing because it became it was very clear that there were there were there was there was politics involved, right? That, that, that these weren't pure so-called, you know, objectively legal determinations that were being made, but rather determinations that were suffused with politics. Thank you for that answer. Now, I think in your presentation, you alluded to the fact that depending on which state of the US it is the approach of the court has been a bit different. 
And but I think particularly you mentioned New York uh, yeah. practice is different from others. So could you shed some more light on that? That why would some jurisdiction be a bit more claimant friendly than others when it comes to FSIA? Thank you. I mean, again, I think if we're and this is you know speculative. I mean, there you know the Supreme Court once it comes out and takes a position on an issue, you know that is supposedly the end of the conversation. But you know. After the decision in Weltover, you know, courts didn't all go in the same direction in terms of how they understood the direct effect clause. So some ended up being actually um, more rigid in terms of how they interpreted direct effect. And that actually includes the Second Circuit, uh, perhaps surprisingly, whereas other jurisdictions, including the DC Circuit, were more flexible with that. Um, the, the DC Circuit and the Sixth Circuit, which you know I, I don't exactly know why the Sixth Circuit would be more, more flexible. So you know there are some, some things that I can't give a great explanation for in terms of why the courts go, in, why the lower courts go in one direction versus another. But I will say that the Second Circuit has generally taken a more, shall we say, plaintiff-friendly approach when it comes to cases involving um, global financial markets or global financial interests. So the interpretation of the direct effect clause that uh, the Supreme Court adopts in Weltover was actually one that had been first developed in the Second Circuit by the Second Circuit Courts um, in a series of cases that involved the country of Nigeria's default on contracts that it had issued um, after it had experienced this massive oil oil boom, and then and then oil shares drop, it becomes unable to fulfill some of these contracts, and it starts defaulting or trying to reschedule its debts. And the New York courts step in, and they develop for the first time. Up to that point, the territorial, the direct effect clause had been more narrowly interpreted, actually an uh, interpretation that had also developed uh, in, in cases brought by individuals for personal injury claims. It adopts a much more expansive test in that case for the first time. Um, and again, it actually mentions uh, those global financial interests in its decision in rendering this outcome. That broader interpretation is the one that the Supreme Court adopts in the Weltover case. Uh, now, again, as I mentioned, this, the Second Circuit has perhaps not been as expansive since Weltover. It still adopted that expansive definition, but not to the same extent as some other jurisdictions. But it is it was responsible for establishing that approach in the first place. So I think, again, to some extent at least, um, especially when it comes to that circuit, uh, you can see the ways in which capitalist interests are reflected in the interpretations that the lower courts adopt. Thank you for that answer. And I think the next question that I have for you is very closely related to this one. And again, you might call it a bit speculative, but I'm sure as I read your paper and as I listened to your presentation, you have made this case that when it comes to corporate uh, actors, both as applicant and also as defendant in these cases, they have tended to win more than maybe nat uh, natural persons. So what could it, what could be the underlying reason? Could it be that they were uh, represented by better legal team or some sort of uh, bias I in mean the system or some judicial, Friend, any view on that? Again, I mean, you know, it's always difficult when you try and make a pure causal argument, which is why I try and stay away from it here. I don't try and explain, you know, why the outcomes are, are the way they are based on sort of one factor or even two or three, because I think that's very hard to do. Certainly, corporations you know, at least the presumption is that they have the pockets, the deep pockets to be able to hire better attorneys, you know, so, you know, that usually means better outcomes, right? Uh, but at the same time, foreign governments, you know, not all of them, but a lot of them also have deep pockets. 
and can hire the same kinds of attorneys, right? So I don't know if the attorneys themselves, you know, are the real determinative factor here because both sides, right? At least in terms of the corporate actors, like certainly the individual actors, that's, we could argue about a differential there. But with the corporate actors and the state actors, you know, for a lot of them, you know, they're working with the same elite group of law firms. That being said, I mean, you know, attorneys, and I get into this briefly towards the end of the paper, you know, if you are, you know, a country or a corporation entering into a contract, a commercial contract, you know, your attorneys are going to be aware of the commercial activity exception and the kinds of contractual agreements are more likely to trigger that exception, right? So they can, you can draft contracts that make it more likely for you to be able to win or lose depending upon who you are um, in this equation when the time comes to be sued, right? So I would, I would, I would think the corporate actors are better able to position themselves, you know, in advance in a way that helps to bolster their ability to sue in U.S. courts if they need to do that later on. Thank you. The next question that I'd like to put to you is on the very idea of evolution of capitalism. So mm -hmm. even in the U.S., you are you as you have highlighted in your paper that there is increasing inequality, and there is more question being raised about the uh, sort of capitalist model. Uh, can we? foresee some sort of change in the in any direction as you have in the concluding part of your written paper you have posed some I would not say proposals or manifesto but at least some thought on uh, some sort of reform so if right. those reforms are to be brought about what could be the impetus to the reform any view on that Marian? Uh, I mean that's that's a great question I think probably the clearest and easiest way to reform the FSIA. Well, <laughs> maybe not, but I'll say it anyway. Um, at least historically, um, I don't know at this moment, um, would be to go through Congress, not to go through the courts. So to either create additional exceptions or to revise current exceptions, so or definitions for terms that are listed within the FSIA. Um, that can promote more egalitarian approaches at the very least. Now, you know, we can argue about the propriety of, you know, a lot of the different exceptions um, under the FSIA, particularly when it comes to uh, the sovereignty of other states. So the commercial activity exception is, is pretty widely um, embraced by most states. I mean, at this point, it, I would say it's pretty clearly customary international law. You know, the direct effect clause is its own thing, but you know, the commercial activity exception to, um, to foreign sovereign immunity, that's very well established. But other exceptions that are noted that, that are included in the in the FSIA, like the terrorism exception to the Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act, that is not, you know, customary international law. And it is very selectively applied. It is applied, in fact, you, the State Department has an immense role in those cases because it has to designate those states as state sponsors of terrorism in order for them to be subject to that exception. There's another terror, there are two terrorism exceptions. That one I just mentioned is the older one. The newer one was passed a few years ago and it was really a response to 9-11. It's about terrorist um, acts that occur in the United States. That doesn't require the State Department to designate any state as a state sponsor of terrorism, but it does allow the U.S. president to intervene, the executive branch to intervene and basically stay the case to resolve it politically. Now, you know, whatever you think about those two exceptions, they are relatively unique in international law. And one could argue that they are quite um problematic in terms of how they um, impact other states. But to go back to your question, those were also exceptions that were advocated for by prospective plaintiffs, people who wanted to bring cases against these states, but couldn't bring them because of foreign sovereign immunity. Now, terrorism has a very special place in the United States and its political lexicon. It is relatively difficult for any U.S. Congressperson to oppose 
uh, exception like that, especially if it targets certain kinds of countries. Is it likely that we could get some kind of exception that, that you know specifically and more broadly embraces human rights claims? You know, a lot of the cases that, um, not a lot of them, but some of the cases I discussed in the paper under the commercial activity were attempts to bring human rights cases through the, the avenue of the commercial activity exception. They have by and large failed. If we want an exception that embraces those sorts of things, I think it will have to come from Congress. Will it come from Congress though? I don't know. But I think it's more likely to come from Congress than it is to come from the court. So as awful and dysfunctional as the US legislature is, um, it isn't that much more dysfunctional than the U.S. courts, and it has a very direct avenue to actually change the law. But it's going to take some serious lobbying. You don't need a lot of people, but you do need a very strong and powerful lobby in order to make those changes. Thank you for that answer, and thank you once again for your time and the excellent lecture. And many thanks to our audience for their time. All of you have a good day. Bye. Thanks to all of you. I really enjoyed it. Take care. Yeah. Have a great Thank evening. You. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.